probably the first thing you notice I had to pull the mic down. <laughs> I am standing up. Uh, I've got all sorts of short jokes I've been given my whole life. But uh, actually, earlier, uh, you were given the Tony Marlowe Award, and it reminded me of a story I had to change my opening a little bit. But I dated Tina Marlowe for about two months before she dumped me. <laughs> and I think she really got the idea that uh, that probably would be better to marry the guy that makes the golf balls that everybody hits instead of the guy that hits the golf ball. <laughs> you could do a lot better. And I actually had a funny story. And, and this is the kind of guy I've kind of come from a different angle a lot, but I was at Woodmont trying for the uh, U.S. Open qualifier, and and uh, Peter, their son, Peter uh, Uline, was there. And I had never met Peter. And I know. Uh, I actually wasn't even sure whether he knew me or not. And I go up to him, and I go, Peter, Fred Punk, how are you? And he goes, good. You know, he's, he's a big boy. And I go, I just want to let you know, you could have been a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and and Tina, Tina was like 20 feet away, and she goes, really? You I said, sorry, Tina, I just had to say something. And I was thinking earlier, too, when you were introducing Jacqueline. Which one's Jacqueline? Right there, with a four seven five, right? Yeah. And who's the astrophysicist? You? Is that a, now, what scale is that? <laughs> Six point nine. Or something? I mean, a four point seven five. My cumulative for the nine years I got took to get my undergraduate wouldn't add up to the four point seven five. But uh, it, it amazing. And Rick, uh, amazing. You're you're. Just a, you're a better guy than you are a golfer, and you're a great golfer. And I really enjoyed the time we had last year at the uh, final round of the Senior PGA. Uh, we had a great time, and, and um, just look forward to playing with you again. And congratulations on everything you're doing here in this section. Um, Think about what's most important in your business today. Does data come to mind? If not, it should. Data is one of our most vital business assets and it's playing an increasingly critical role in decision-making processes. If any of your information is lost or compromised, the resulting costs and impact can be severe. Not to mention the potential damage to your brand and reputation. To ensure true business continuity following a hardware failure or any unplanned downtime, organizations today must have well-defined backup and recovery processes in place. We're here to ensure you don't become another statistic. Our business continuity solution is a powerful platform designed to quickly revive your network when systems fail, meaning your data and your employees will be back up and running quickly. With features like continuous data protection and block level encryption, you can rest easy knowing that critical data, emails, reports, and other information are all protected, backed up, and securely tucked away until you need them. The platform leverages a highly secure cloud and replicates data across multiple data centers to ensure reliability and availability. And it's all available for one affordable rate per device. Don't wait until it's too late. Get in touch with us today to discover how we can support your backup and business continuity needs and provide you with unparalleled peace of mind, freeing you to focus on what matters most, your business. bio and you read or see the video and, and you think it was all success and, and uh, obviously anyone that's played golf for a living know that there's a lot of downs too and, and a lot of fight and a lot of grinding and everything and I had an, obviously an unusual journey because most guys do come out of college and they go to the mini tour they go wherever they went and get to the tour pretty early and obviously I got out when I was 31, 32 years old and after serving as a assistant pro and a head golf coach of Maryland was uh, really special. But I got to back up even further than that because my parents moved to uh, College Park, Maryland when I was seven. And um, I started at Paint Branch, which is a little nine hole right down the street. And then I started sneaking on because I lived about uh, 180 yards behind the 14th green at Maryland across uh, Metz Rock Road. And uh, I could sneak on. I played 15, 16, 11, 12, 13, 14, and that was my little circle, and nobody would ever catch me. 
when I was 11, 12 years old. But I uh, remember Rick Martino, who was our assistant pro. He played for Maryland, and he was our assistant pro there. And he caught me one day, and he said, you got to stop sneaking, sneaking on. You can just come on up to the first tee, and I'll let you out. So I never had to sneak on again. And then I started working there when I was 14. And I was doing carts, and I was doing maintenance, or not maintenance yet, but I was doing carts in the range. And playing a lot of golf, had a paper route, and did all the other stuff that kids do with the boys club. But golf was my passion uh, early on. And we had a great junior program here, the Frank Emmett Junior Program. And I didn't play in a lot of the stuff, but I did play enough that uh, it, it sparked my interest in golf. And then I started working uh, uh, maintenance a little bit. And that was actually a lot of fun. I used to love going out on the with the triplex and mowing the greens. And I got to uh, give my, uh, one of my mentors and, and one of the guys I really look up to the most was our head pro back then was Frank Cronin. And he's one of our Hall of Fame. He's a great guy, but he's a very intimidating guy. And one day I was mowing the greens and, and I had this uh, idea that on the 12th hole of Maryland, it slopes like this front to back could be three now because they switched to nines, but uh, I decided to get to mow it, and we had a lot of grain there, and we never verticut it back then. I don't think our maintenance guy knew what verticutting was, but I would get the broom and sweep up about a six foot radius around the hole, and then I mowed it again, and I did it again, so I triple mowed it with brushing it in the middle, so I had this 12 foot circle that was super quick, and I sat up on the first, on the, uh, 13th tee, and I watched the first group come through, which happened to be Frank Cronin, and they get up there on the green, and, they, and the ball gets in that six foot, or that 12 foot circle, and it just <laughs> and goes on off the green. The next guy does the same thing, and, and then Frank put it up, went by the hole, and put it back off the green, and he's just shaking his head, and I just started zipping off on the mower, and then I got on uh, 14 that morning, I was setting pins too, and put the pin on the false front where the pin was actually in the name. And Frank putted that off the green. And so now I get this call from maintenance when he got done, uh, who did the mowing and the, and the cutting of the pin? And they said Fred did it. So they called in, called me in the office and, and uh, he never shuts the door in the office, shut the door in the office and ring me a new one. And I never did that again. But uh, he was the guy that I always looked up to and gave me a, a great opportunity. But the guy that Jeff Mayer mentioned earlier, and I just didn't think I was going to, I was going to try not to cry tonight. I didn't when he mentioned Ronnie Scales. Ronnie was uh, the best. Um, incredible man. Um, here we go. And uh, here comes Niagara Falls. But incredible man. He gave me so much confidence. And there's... Uh, another man in this room, Bill Sporey, that gave me an opportunity that truly believed in me. Ronnie believed in me, uh, Bill believed in me, and Mike McGinnis, who was at Holly Hills back in the day, was three people that really kind of took me under their wing and just says, you've got something a little different than everybody else. And I didn't know what they were talking about, but I, I just um, always got that, I always got their support. So, Bill, thank you.
part of tonight is not to talk about what I've done on the golf course. It's the people that have just given me so much. Uh, given back. You call it giving back to the game. They gave it to me. They gave me an opportunity to uh, go out there and, and believe in myself and compete. And it said it in the tape. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic section did that. And there's a lot of people in this section that have done that way in the past. And the, and the three icons that I can remember once I became a club pro in the uh, section was uh, Bill Strasbaugh, Bill Clark, and, and uh, Ward Burgess were the three guys that were like the icons of the section. And they were at uh, Hillendale, and they were at uh, Columbia Country Club and Chevy Chase. And when I met those guys, I heard about them, and it was like meeting, you know, my God in the section. They were really great men, uh, great to be around. And that's how a lot of my friends that became friends when I was competing with them and, and playing in the section events. And uh, I actually got a list of them here. And we got quite a few of them in the room. I actually have some really close friends in the room. <coughs> Mark Diley, who worked at Maryland with me. Uh, we go way back. Lynn McCluskey, Lynn's at Loudon. And he grew up in Maryland. He started, I was still a uh, senior at Maryland. And uh, he showed up at the golf course in 1979. And uh, he, he did everything there. And he became everything there. He pretty much ran the golf course. And I'm so glad he stayed in the game of golf. Uh, Glenn Brown was great friends with Woody Fitzhugh. Both of them became really close friends and had so much fun times with them. Uh, obviously, Larry Ringer, uh, he, he was a stickler, but uh, he, he was a tough one, but uh, he, he always got your attention. And uh, Jim Folk is here, another uh, icon, legend, that that just means so much to the section. It's people like that that really grow the section. And then the people I hear tonight, uh, Jeff, what a great, incredible talk tonight. I don't think I'll talk about you. <laughs> I think it's just amazing how good a speaker you are. I don't know how good a listener, but incredible. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I really want to take this time to, to, to show how much it really meant to me to, um, to have had this opportunity in my life um, and how much the section did mean to me. Um, I was really lucky that I got that job because Randy Hoffman was my golf coach uh, or to have this opportunity because when Randy was my golf coach, I had finished my eligibility and I still had uh, 18 credits left. He says, you've got to finish. I said, I don't want to finish. I don't want to, I want to go try to mini tour. And uh, he says, no, you've got to get that degree. So you're going to need it. And I did. I went back. I took 18 credits. I actually made a 3.25. But I didn't have any golf to play that, that semester. So I, I got my degree. I went on to the mini tour. I went broke down at the Space Coast mini tour. I come back, and that was all of 81. I come back in the winter of 81, and I was working a manpower job. I was cleaning up this burned out warehouse, and my coach got promoted to assistant AD, and he offered me a coaching job. I said, yes, I'll take it. And it was 18,000 a year as a coach. I don't know what these coaches make now, but it's, they're making a lot more than 18,000 a year. And I remember my last year, I made 22,000, but I could make whatever I made playing and whatever I made teaching. It's funny that it was mentioned earlier, Jeff, that I have lessons. So many that I gave when I didn't think I hated to teach. I really just didn't like teaching. I like playing and I like, I love teaching guys that, and men and women that really wanted to work at the game. Unless the person wants to put the time in. So I didn't really focus on teaching, but I was making $15 an hour. And I owe you 200 for two? <laughs> I'll give you 30. <laughs> okay, all right, 50. And a beer. <laughs> you find a beer, all right, we'll do that. But uh, it, it really was a long journey and, and uh, just to get to the section part. And, and then I started, and then my aspiration, I knew I wasn't good enough for the PGA Tour at that point. And I always put them way up on the pedestal, even though I knew better, because I saw it all from being a golf coach. I saw the Davis Loves and the Gary Hallbergs and the best of the best come through, and they were really good. But there's other guys that were not as good, 
And I didn't think I was as good as them. So I, I just kept working at my game and playing in the section events. And what they said in that tape was exactly dead on. I got used to shooting low numbers uh, by playing the white tees with the, with the amateurs we brought every Monday and Friday. And then when we stepped back, I still expected to, to shoot those scores. So the mid-Atlantic section, the way they formatted the tournaments, tournaments and the amount that we had, we were in competition a lot. And it really gave me that, that spark that I really needed. Um, you know, making the, the cup teams was, was something that I never imagined. I never imagined I would make a Ryder Cup team or a President's Cup team. Well, back when I started, we didn't have President's Cup, but uh, especially a Ryder Cup team. And playing for your country is, is something that's really, really special. And, uh, and getting on a first name basis with Arnie and Jack and the highlight of my golf career was playing a practice round with Arnie and Jack at Augusta in 1997, and that was really cool. And I got up, I got up on the first tee, and Arnie hits, Jack hits, and I was playing with Ken Bast. He was a mid-am champ, and he was my partner. We're playing him in a pile of an asshole. And I snap hooked it on one, duck slice it on two, pull hooked it on three. Jack hits me in the shoulder, and he goes, "What the hell's wrong with you?" I go, Jack. I can handle one legend at a time, pal. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so, that was, that was um, a great day. They talked about themselves and, and, and how they became friends, how Jack came on, and everybody loved Arnie and Arnie's army, and then they talked about all the greats of the game in the history of Augusta. So there's been a lot of great stories and uh, great experiences that I've had out there on the tour. But the fondest memories I have, especially when I come back home, um, with the people that I grew up with, and my game got better and better, uh, and just having the camaraderie that we mentioned earlier with all the guys in this room and, and all the people that are in the section, and, and basically all the old guys, because time has really gone by. I can't believe it. <laughs> 61 now, it's ridiculous. But uh, it's, it, it's the time that that I can't replace, but you can't replace it. I would never dream of the childhood I had at the University of Maryland. I'd never dream the career I had at the Mid-Atlantic section and then went on <laughs> the PGA Tour. Um, they have that saying, living a dream, and I did live a dream. And working a job, you're not really working when you're doing something you have passion doing. And my passion is the game of golf, and it's, it's a game that's very addicting, very humbling but very rewarding all at the same time. And the most rewarding part of it is the friendships and the giving back to people when you get to the position after playing for so long and having this opportunity to actually give back to the game of golf. Uh, as a club pro, you guys do it day in and day out. As a competitor playing, I love coming back and, and trying to do everything I can for the, uh, my passion as a military and kids and giving back to the game in that way. Um, so tonight is an incredible special night for me, obviously, and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget all the, the times I had. I want to thank everybody in this room for coming and the special people in my life that, that have had so much influence, like these two that have already been uh, separated out, and uh, you guys are one of the best. And, and the ones that are up in heaven watching, uh, listening, and have given so much back. And, they, and we're smiling at them and they're smiling at us. So it's uh, been a real blessing. And I can't thank you guys enough. So um, again, it's been great. Thank you.